or not, they spend billions of dollars to understand the psychology of the working class people. Uh, and that's why they know exactly what triggers to pull and what buttons to push to make sure that you want to take part in uh, these so-called holiday festivities. And as you guys well know, we've gotten completely away from uh, what this season is all about. And it's all about spending. It's all about um, uh, one upping the next person and uh, who can buy the most stuff for their children and all that kind of stuff. And then the New Year's re resolutions will come and everybody's trying to fix these problems that they created <laughs> during these holiday seasons. Is there a way of having your dollar go on a diet? <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, what, what people miss in this day and age, if you're going to uh, participate uh, in Black Friday and this holiday spending, and, and like I said, if you have a plan, uh, you can really control that and put that dollar on a diet. Another thing that we have to do is take in consideration the technology of today and most of these companies allow you to set up what's called an affiliate program. So if you're going to shop with Macy's anyway, you can actually set up an affiliate program so some of that money that you spend will actually come back to you in form of a commission. So that would be a way to boomerang some of those dollars and uh, get some benefit from spending at some of your favorite stores. So I, I would try that uh, definitely. How do you look into that? Uh, I, I would at the bottom of every company's website. Okay, that's right. uh, Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. At the bottom of every company's website, uh, they usually have a link to their affiliate program. Because you think about it, uh, we we are on the radio, and radio has served us uh, well for the last hundred years or so. But now with the internet, uh, YouTube, and and other platforms, advertisers are looking for other ways to bring people in without having to spend the money. Uh, one of the ways that they figured out how to do that is through uh, affiliate programs. So instead of them having to spend ad dollars to uh, get their message out, uh, they can give me a kickback for shopping at their store. And uh, I would then in turn tell my friends to shop at their store through my affiliate link. And I earn some commissions by promoting their brand and promoting their websites to my friends and family as well. I have seen that at the bottom of websites, but I've never clicked on it. Yeah. And then I actually heard about that also. So that's another, that's a sidebar or a, another stream of income as well, but mm -hmm. in the hopes that you're going to take that money and then turn around and uh, re reinvest it Absol in business. Absolutely. I, I would say if you're not uh, in the place where you, you, you're ready to start a business uh, full-fledged, then at least be having an affiliate account with several of the stores. I mean, I'm an affiliate with Amazon, so... Uh, every time I buy books and things of that nature, uh, then I get a kickback. Uh, so uh, that's just a way to save money. But um, definitely, I mean, we're in America. If, if you don't have a business in America in 2017, you might as well be a foreigner in your own country. Wow, that, that says that's a wild. lot. And what is the benefit, really, in having a business if I work a 9 to 5 at a brick and mortar? Yeah. What is the benefit of me trying to have a home-based business? I, I think what, what people don't realize is we say all the time how wealthy people don't pay taxes, right? Uh, but what we miss is that's how they got wealthy, <laughs> by paying mm -hmm. a, a minimum amount of taxes. And that's because they understand that the tax code was written for business people, by business people, and to benefit business people. Uh, so there's three three entities that will allow you to, to use that. And what I call the tax code is the number one wealth building tool in the world. Uh, and if you're a landowner, if you're an investor, or if you're a business owner, then you can use that tax code to build wealth. So adding a home-based business to your wealth building portfolio will allow you to reduce your taxable income uh, and save anywhere from twelve to fifteen thousand dollars per year on average via taxes. Uh, now, let me give you my disclaimer: I'm not a tax professional, or uh, you want to talk to your CPA about that. But definitely uh, look into it because if there is a way for you to save twelve to fifteen thousand dollars a year, chances are that's the same money you're using to manage your debt. So that's money that you can use to pay down your debt. And once your debt is gone, now magically you freed up the money that you need to start investing, whether that's Bitcoin, whether it's real estate, whatever you want to invest in. The number one problem with investing is people are afraid because they don't have the education and they don't have the money. So uh, if you get the money back that you're giving to Uncle Sam uh, willingly, uh, when you don't necessarily have to, especially if you're thinking about starting a business, then you can literally take that money and do some other things with it. I have a question here. 
when people receive their tax refund, mm -hmm. what do you recommend that they do with that? If they have not started a business and if they want to start a business, yeah. how do you recommend that they? Uh, again, I'm, this is not financial advice, I know, I but um, you know what? You, you think about legacy, and that's on my mind 24-7. Every hour I get older, I'm thinking more and more about the legacy that I'm going to leave for my children. you got two choices. You can either leave a mark on this world or you can leave a stain. Uh, so I'm trying to leave a mark through the legacy that I leave for my children. So you want to get in the habit of buying things that's going to accumulate and increase in value. There's really only one wealth building formula in all the world. There's only ever been one. There will only ever be one. And that's cash, asset, cash. Every time you get your hands on some cash, you use some of it to buy, build, or invest in an asset that's going to bring you some more cash. When that becomes your life's habit, then you build wealth on autopilot. So all those people who are getting those big tax refunds, uh, A, you're getting them because you overpay taxes all year long. <laughs> so that's one. Uh, and B, now that you have it, you want to make sure that you're using some of it at least to buy, build, or invest in some sort of income-producing asset that's going to bring you back some more cash. You, you had a video on... Facebook. I, mm -hmm. I believe it was Facebook. If it wasn't, mm -hmm. then Instagram. You had a video posted that should have had a lot of people scratching their heads. Mm -hmm. You were speaking about in 2017 the profitability of growing your own and harvesting your own co uh, cotton. Mm -hmm. Kind of go into that for our listeners. Well, I, what you have to look at is um, <clears throat> cotton is still a cash crop. It always has been, even when we were uh, <laughs> a cash crop today. Uh, and it's a raw material that's needed. If we look around this room, who doesn't have something made of cotton on? It's a cash crop. And when you think about a raw materials business, then I want you to think about um, other raw materials like uh, iron ore, that's which they turn into steel, and, and you think about copper and mining like that. Well, here, you can go buy you a few cotton seeds for 2 or $3.00 those few cotton seeds will turn into thousands of cotton seeds which you can plant again that will turn into millions of cotton seeds that will turn into thousands of pounds of cotton so I think um, I, I get our relationship with the cotton industry being uh, we were slaves for so long um, but what if that one industry became the saving grace for uh, blacks in this country because you could literally grow cotton on all of these vacant lots that we have uh, all throughout every metropolis in the country, not just St. Louis. You know, you guys know that all the inner cities look the exact, exactly the same. So there's open land, um, and that could be a cash crop that we could start to use and uh, start creating our own economy from. Answer this question for me, because I do not know. Where is cotton today in 2017 grown in a mass force? Where is that? Uh, uh, it's, it's, still the grown in the, it's still grown in the South. Okay. Uh, but primarily uh, in Africa, uh, and, and one of the reasons that I started growing cotton is because um, I, I, I read what uh, some of the big agri companies, okay, uh, and, and, and some of the, the uh, agribusinesses were doing in terms of genetically modifying seeds and things of that nature, and uh, when I read about what, what was happening to the families in Africa, you're talking about forms that were passed down uh, for hundreds of years. Uh, being lost because of uh, what's going on in the agribusiness and uh, basically Monsanto and some of the other big agri companies have modified seeds in terms of uh, making them what we call terminator seeds so if I buy a seed from Monsanto that seed is good for one harvest and I cannot replant the seeds that are produced again so I have to buy seeds from them over and over every year well, any good farmer knows the number one thing that you want to do is save seeds for the next harvest. Well, you can't save a Monsanto seed or some of these other big business seeds because uh, they have these terminator genes and things of that nature in them. So you have to go back and buy from them every year. And a lot of African farmers were uh, actually losing some of their uh, farms because once they got in the bed with Monsanto, the uh, crops didn't produce as well, and then they had to continue to spend more and more money buying new seed every year, and that left them in a tremendous amount of debt, and, and they lost a lot of their farms. And you said that was a business deal that Monsanto manipulated them into jumping into? I, I believe so, uh, and I don't want to be accusatory, but uh, from my research, then uh, basically 
Uh, the one of the reasons that Monsanto has manipulated the seeds in the way that they have is because when you're growing cotton, it takes a tremendous amount of pesticides to uh, keep them healthy and to keep the bugs from eating them up. So one of the things that Monsanto did, uh, and some of the other companies do the same thing, is they make the the plants resistant to their um, pesticides. So the sale was you buy these seeds, they're going to be resistant to pesticides, they're going to yield a bigger uh, harvest for you. Uh, and a lot of African farmers found out that that just was not true. Um, and they got smaller yields uh, because they are resistant to uh, pesticides. They had to buy more and more of the Monsanto pesticide to go with the Monsanto seed. Uh, and basically that put them in debt to Monsanto. Well, years ago when we didn't have the, uh, to my knowledge, the pesticides, mm -hmm. when slavery was in full effect, Mm -hmm. We had such a huge. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. See that right. Was, but that's the reality. Right. Yeah. It, yeah. It we didn't have all the pesticides back in the day. Yeah. And it was a booming industry. Yeah. And 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 that's that's basically uh, a lot of these companies want to patent and own life, and that's what they're doing with with the GMO uh, seeds. Uh, and basically, if you think about it. If I sold you a seed that was resistant to a pesticide that I create, so it's like the, the seed comes with the pesticide. So you buy the seed, then you buy the pesticide. The seed does not produce of itself a, a seed that can be replicated. So next year you have to buy more seed. And when you buy more seed, what else do you have to buy? You have to buy more pesticides. <laughs> so that's how a lot of, and, and I, I think at one point uh, during my studies, I've, I found that, that uh, hundreds of, of African farmers were committing suicide every month uh, behind uh, the shame of losing the family land and the family farm. So, uh, but you know, that's, it, it's a dirty game, man. Uh, and, and I tell everybody that, that business and capitalism, it, it's warfare. So uh, I get why some people don't go into business um, because you got to be prepared to, to go to war with, with some of these big companies sometimes. And you know, with that being said, having the money to invest in anything mm -hmm. is first and foremost, you have to be able to have that asset available to yes. you. One of the things that you um, teach mm -hmm. is about that W you for form yes talk just a little bit about that how can I today mm -hmm. working mm -hmm. save more money just simply changing my w-4 form yeah uh, according to the IRS eight out of ten people have their w-4 form filled out incorrectly uh, 101 tax refunds go out every year because of the lack of understanding behind this form. A, your HR personnel cannot teach you how to fill that form out because it's a tax form and they don't want to get into any liability issues with you know, giving tax advice or anything uh, of that nature. So you're basically uh, brought into a job and most people are so excited that they got a job, uh, they're put in the corner and say, hey, fill all these paperwork out and then just turn it back in. And when people look at that form, it's a little bit intimidating. They know it's an, an IRS related form and we have been taught to fear the IRS. Uh, so they're scared and they just basically put one or zero on their form. Someone told them when they got their very first job, put one on zero on the form and keep it moving. Well, that form is designed for your employer to withhold the correct amount of uh, taxes from your paycheck. And if you fill it out incorrectly, they're going to withhold too much. And most people are having too much withheld. That's why they get a tax refund. Um, and sometimes they think that their uh, tax preparer is doing them a favor. No, you're just getting back the money that you overpaid into the system all year. And here's what's funny. Uh, people will jump for joy for a $3,500 tax refund check, but they overpay taxes 10000 Wow. So you overpaid 10000 got 3500 back, and you're excited. Wow. Right? So, uh, A, you need to just understand how that form works. If you just read it, it's very easy to understand if you just read it. But again, because people fear what, uh, uh, what they don't know, they're intimidated, so they don't take the time to read it. But if just correcting that form and doing it correctly and having the correct amount withheld from your paycheck can increase your take-home pay on your job anywhere from two to $600 a month. I helped a family last year. Husband was overpaying $300, wife was overpaying $700. So that's a $1,000 per month increase into their household budget. Now, for most working class people, that's life-changing money. That's life-changing money. Dallas, um, you look like you, <laughs> you got a gift for Christmas early, huh? That's true, sweetie. <laughs> Two to $600 a month? Yes. yes. 
See, most people look at that form and because there's one question on that form that asks about dependents, they think that form is about how many children you have. But that form is about allowances. Your dependent is an allowance. So that form is to record properly the right amount of allowances that you have uh, in your current situation, right? So what you have to do is understand that form. If you read it at the top, it says you should revisit this form every year when, or when your financial situation changed. Get married, financial situation changed. Got divorced, it changed again. Had a kid, it changed. You should be changing that form every time you have a How slight can, change of situation. How uh, can we get in touch with you if there are our viewers and our listeners want to learn a little bit more about your financial mm -hmm. strategies? Sure. How can they get in touch with you? Uh, best way would be to go to www.hcortezthornton.com. Uh, giving away three free gifts just for visiting uh, the site and checking me out. It's www.hcortezthornton.com, and everything can you can get all my other contact information from there. Wonderful. All righty, financial strategist, and if nothing else, who can show you how to get two to six hundred dollars? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Your paycheck, H. Cortez Thornton. Uh, look him up on Facebook as well, and go to hcortezthornton.com. <laughs> Sir, thank you so much for coming into our studios and Appreciate giving us those calories. You know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Appreciate you guys so much for having me. Thank you. All right. Ray J. Yes. LeVar Ball. Yes. I understand there, is this the internet battle that you're speaking about? That, well, no, the okay. internet battle is actually more about companies. So something that's going on with the internet battle is that they may want to start monitoring a little bit more on what sites you're able to go to so like there are some navigational sites that you are able, there are some sites you're able to go to for free for example oh i mean google you okay. can go to google and pull up any kind of site that you want to pull up right okay. well they're already regulating the government is already watching everything that we do on the internet as it is but they want to kind of stop micromanaging to the point of where they put a lockdown on certain things and unless you have monies like corporations that say for example Netflix Netflix may be able to afford to do some things on the internet and go to certain sites that you as a consumer would not be able to and so it's kind of like it's an unfair regulation because they want rural areas to also be able to have access but they're so busy monitoring what everybody else is doing that they know that it's not fair and equitable across the board so if they start to give up some of this and look at corporations to spend more money um, in going to certain sites or even having access at all they feel like that will cut back on some of the things that they're charging. Now, I think the internet services and providers have a lot of money that they could get rural areas to get more access to the internet if they wanted to. But for some reason, it's this battle over who should have access and who shouldn't to certain sites. So that's pretty much what's going on with the internet battle. Okay, I'm kind of what, what, what would a site that you could not have access to be? They have not mentioned specifically okay. what sites because I don't think they want to put, you know, fear out there that, oh, I'm not going to be able to access this information or I'm not going to be able to do that. So they're kind of just speaking in generalities. So, for example, uh, they don't want to have, they may slow your speed down. Oh. That could be something that they do. Um, they may also have priorities on who has access to a certain site and who doesn't based on what it is that you're doing so if you're a company yes we'll give you access to this but if you're not then you may have to pay a little more to have access to this so this is something that's kind of buzzing right now in the digital <laughs> in the digital age and then they're offering faster speeds maybe that you won't be able to afford because you know how impatient we have gotten now with the internet and now to have to pay more for more speed that's something else that that could quite possibly take place so the speed that you're used to 
or are they slowing that speed down and then charging you to re it's a, po it's a possibility but you know what businesses like netflix and amazon do not think is fair they they don't approve of this internet battle so that lets you know because all big companies started off as small companies. Right. I remember when Netflix first started. Yeah. The, the DVD in the mail, right? You put it back in the mailbox and like three, four days later, boom, here comes another. And you all excited. You guys realize they, no, they tried to partner with Blockbuster? Who was this one? Netflix. Netflix. Netflix tried to partner with Blockbuster. Blockbuster. That, was, that was their first pitch. Yeah, because you know Blockbuster kind of like faded and started to go away behind that. No, okay. they're gone. So now the mom and pop video stores. Oh, we gotta go to work tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> the mom and pop video stores that are out here now. Thanks everybody. I mean.